Moctezuma and I'm the gallery director here. I'm also a professor uh, lead of museum studies and I'm so happy that you're joining us here today to hear uh, Larry and Debbie Klein talk about their work, about their process and, and show us um, you know, some of the pieces. Uh, you've seen the exhibit, it's pretty wild, huh? Yeah. Really amazing. <laughs> so. Um, this, I just first want to say that this is a collaboration of us working with the artists, working with our students, and so uh, Debbie and Larry were here uh, before it got really hot actually, I think the weather was still <laughs> pleasant, but for two weeks they were here working with our students. Uh, I realized that maybe we brought too much when we went into the storage space and it was filled from the bottom to the ceiling with boxes. <laughs> but, um, I actually had, um, had the opportunity of seeing Debbie and Larry's work several years ago. My advanced museum studies class curates an exhibit at a venue in San Diego. They have to find the venue and they have to find the artist. They do a call for artists. So several years ago, uh, a group of students uh, sent out a call for um, proposals and call for artists and Debbie and Larry Klein sent in their work. And I remember the excitement when as a group, as a class, we saw their website and we saw their pieces. And at that time, we really wanted, I remember the students really wanted to show the um, enlightenment piece, the columns. But then uh, this show was space for art. They were very generous to offer us their gallery, but it was only gonna be for a week. And so we realized that this was going to be a huge endeavor and it was going to be just too difficult. So, so at that time, we, um, this, the students went and did a studio visit, visit and they select, selected some works from the candy store. And, um, and I was just so thrilled. That show was fabulous. And um, later, I um, arranged to do a studio visit and I couldn't... I, they would show me a piece and I said, oh, we have to have that. And they would show me something else, I said, oh, we have to have that. And that's why the show ended up, you know, the gallery filled with so much work. But I, I love it. I think it looks great. I think it introduces our students to the breadth and kind of the depth of issues that they deal with. I also think um, I chose... You know, I chose their work because they have a sense of humor. You know, they, they're provocative and yet they invite us in because they also make us smile. And so I really uh, like that about their work. And, um, you know, they have uh, shown their work uh, here locally, but also in San Francisco, all the way to a across the ocean in Israel. They had an exhibit at a museum there. So they're artists that are recognized, you know, they've done public art pieces. Um, and the caliber of work that they bring here is just fantastic. So I'm not going to, you know, I know they're going to talk about their work, so I'm not going to continue, but um, I just wanted to thank uh, my museum studies students. Andrew is here. He helped with the installation. <laughs> the finishing touch of an, of, an ex of an exhibition is the lighting. You know, you can have a most beautiful show, but if you don't have the right lighting, you know, it might not work, but Andrew, did a masterful work in the lighting, so thank you. And then we had so many other students that assisted, many of our students that helped today with the reception and that have been gallery sitting. And so, um, so I want to thank all of them. And of course, Pat Vine, who's never here because she's always managing, you know, the, the cleanup. But she's my gallery coordinator, and she helps with all the myriads of details. So 
just so that you know that you know without her we couldn't get all these things done and um, and all the wonderful staff that we have at Mesa, Michael Gast, and all the other people that help us. Um, so after their talk, we will have some time for Q and A. So if you want to stay, if you have, if you can, if you have some questions, you can jot them down, and we can ask them at the end. And um, thank you so much for coming. They also will be doing a gallery talk on September 20th, a Friday at 1 p.m. in the gallery. So to show a little bit more about their process, their ceramics, they show some of them also. All right, so thank you so much for coming, and here's Debbie and Larry Klein. Thank you. Switch papers. <laughs> this is messy. Um, I don't know. Can you? Do you want to turn down a little? Right, a little? It's, it's up to you guys. Yeah. Can you turn it down, down a little? Yeah. Okay. I'll dim it up. A little ambiance. A little mood music, perhaps. A little, little wine. <laughs> little wine. Mom. No. <laughs> okay, so he's Debbie. No. <laughs> We're Debbie and Larry Klein. I am Debbie. And um, just to expound on what she said a little bit, you should know that Larry and I both have um, museum careers before, and we watched a lot of people in museums walk right by some of the most significant artworks of our time and beyond our time. And with that, when we started making artwork together, we decided that it was very important to do something that made people, number one, turn their head and look at it, right, and pay attention to it. And then, after we get them, then we can kind of, uh, well, I say slap around a little bit, but, you know, make you think a little bit more. And that's the, the topic of the, the um, exhibition is poke. And, of course, everybody who's on Facebook knows what that means, right? <laughs> and so the, pro the pro pro provocate provocate <laughs> provocateurs that we, we try to be um, plays into that as well. So, and Larry had some things he wanted to say. Um, well, I guess the first thing, actually something really important about what we do is we embrace the spirit of play in the work that we do. And that doesn't mean play without intention. You can play and still do something that ends up, you know, being very serious and have sort of greater meaning. Um, but I think everybody that develops something, you know, whether you're an artist, whether you're working in the sciences, you know, whatever it is, you basically take what exists already and you kind of stand on top of that and then you see what potential it has, you know, how you can tweak it, what other things you can do with it. And that's what happens with a lot of the pieces that we have here. And I think that's also why it has like a sort of duality to it. There are objects or maybe techniques that might be familiar, but we're kind of using it in a way that it's not normally done. And that's, you know, part of the idea of playing with it. Um, the towers, for example, you know, are made from low fire clay and they're eight feet tall. And anybody who really knows about clay knows that's an insane thing to do, right? <laughs> you just don't do it. Um, but the and probably if we knew, we, we might not have attempted that. But the idea was to kind of play with the technology that we had, and we said, you know, what else can you do with this? Well, can you make architecture out of this little sort of crap that's meant to be, you know, in this kind of scale? And, and with a kiln, and with a kiln that is only about, you know, <laughs> yes, it fired one segment at a time, so this thing kind of like <laughs> progressed. Took a while. Slow. Took a while. Um, Oh, also, I want to backtrack just a second and then to say something else about what Alessandra said. We do sincerely thank all of the interns who worked on this show. You are the most dedicated, wonderful group of students we have, have ever worked with in that way, and we appreciate it. I just want to say, I, I know there are more, especially the gallery center, sitters, but I don't know all your names, but I do know... Number one, Pat, I just saw you walk in here. Thank you, girl, everybody. She's the engine. <laughs> and of course, Alessandra. And then there was Andrew, as we mentioned before. And Kim, Kim, I saw you there. Sarah, is Sarah here? Uh, also, Elizabeth? Yes. And I, I think we got everybody who worked immediately with us. If I forgot anybody, please forgive us. But now, I, I, I wanted to make sure we said that. So that we're talking about the Age of Enlightenment. And um, this particular column is called Crusading Angels. And I don't know if any of you um, got to read the wall didactics and things like that, but this whole piece is about religion and conflict. Did you want to say anything else about that particular one? Um, well, 
It's, it's about that, and it's also about the fact that symbols mean different things to different people in different contexts, so that all symbolism um, is kind of fungible and changeable in a way. Um, and a lot of these pieces, there were a lot of transitions through them and also a lot of sort of happy accidents. This, for example, that you're looking at, you can see there's an angel with a bandaged leg. Um, this actually happened because we were working with, um, we had a crew of interns, probably six interns that worked with us over the course of a year to make these. And, you know, we were making them very quickly, maybe thinking later the context, and this angel was poured and it was put in a basket and it rained and it filled with water and the leg disintegrated. <laughs> and, you know, some people would look at it and go, oh, this is, you know, this is horrible, it's destroyed, we have to start again. But, you know, immediately the idea is, well, we'll bandage the leg. And then we looked at the foot, and the foot, um, if you look on the left foot over here, it has what looks like a high heel. Well, that's actually the sprue for pouring the, the ceramic in, and usually those things Ceramicist, are cut off. I hear you. And so we thought, ah, you know, don't ask, don't tell. You know, all these, all these things that kind of immediately pop into your mind, and then you make the decision, is this, is this something we want to keep or we don't want to keep? So there are little nuances all over that piece and all of our other pieces too that sometimes you would never see unless you really look at it very closely. And even some of our interns don't know some of the details that we're, we're telling uh, in this. And of course then um, this piece also talks about crusades and Christian crusades. And um, as you can see down here at the bottom, the little angel with this whole thing of crutches uh, religion, you know, it's a wonderful thing to have and to hold, and, and we say this at um, Rosh Hashanah, for those of you who might be Jewish and still here tonight, I know there are a few, <laughs> um, but religion creates such a conflict, and of course here we have this little guy with all these crutches because there are so many casualties of war. And I think also something that these towers make evident is the way that religions tend to borrow from each other. You see yes. iconography that kind of rings through you know, all of these things, and that's something that people don't talk about. They talk about the differences in religion, not recognizing those connections. So what we decided we we're going to do is actually have some um, stills of each one of the columns and maybe a few different images of it to kind of show you the transition um, that sometimes happens as you work your way up. Also important to note is these, a, a lot of these are commercially made molds, and uh, the woman we bought the kiln from gave them to us because she was moving and didn't know what to do with them. So we took them thinking, I don't know what to do with these either. You know, as artists, we would never, you know, make commercial molds and sell, you know, Santa Clauses and whatever. So we, we kept them for a long time. And just before we were ready to throw them out, all of a sudden we started looking at them and realized there's, there's a nice piece here. We could use these. And so that's, that's what the genesis of the piece, pun intended, um, <laughs> started. So this particular piece, the Crusading <coughs> Angels, you work your way up the column, there's an angel missing arms, and the angels are all crying. And then at the very top of this, there's kind of a weird thing happening. Well, you have the angel at the very top is actually tearing this thing apart. Um, and then underneath that, you see these images. The images are a Thanksgiving turkey and a baby Jesus. Several um, baby Jesus. Yes, as you work your way around. And we... Immediate, immediately like chose these things because they keystone really well together. They fit well on the form and they look like they were meant to be. And then immediately we're looking at them and thinking, well, in a way these are all sacrificial and they're all sacrificial for the benefit of others, you could say. Um, Except every Thanksgiving our president pardons a turkey. True. And then we have this column, which is the Great Transformation, Santa into Moses. So if you look inside the sarcophagus, you will actually see the mold that this was made from. It is a Santa Claus mold. Um, but we realized that this, this wasn't your standard Santa. He wasn't jolly looking. It was sort of like a dour, old world Santa. And we realized that this could be transformed in this way. So it actually became Moses. We put horns on him because this is the way he was represented in the Middle Ages and also in the Renaissance. In fact, there's a, a very well-known Michelangelo statue with uh, Moses with horns. It's said to be a mistranslation of the Hebrew and the Hebrew was uh, something to emanate from, and they read that as you know something coming physically coming out of the head, and they would uh, represent it with horns. But then you could also say, it's really well, really a halo, I think. True, but you could also <laughs> say, well, maybe this was actually intentional, and it was meant to sort of demonize. We don't know, but all these things have potential. 
And then what it's actually holding is sort of a simplified version of the Ten Commandments, which is be nice. <laughs> the short version. Which actually we stole that piece from some really great artists. It was Debbie and Larry Klein. And we, we, did, <laughs> we did another piece called Be Nice, so we, we plugged it there. Sometimes these things do get recycled in yeah. some ways. <laughs> which everybody and knows that. On the flip side, you have Moses actually starting to cover his eyes. This could be read in two ways. Um, one, it could be on the Sabbath, you actually light the candles and cover your eyes and let the light kind of come through the cracks in your fingers, or the other thing could be, you could say, be nice, or I don't even want to know what you're doing, <laughs> and on the flip side of it. Also, on, on the base of that column, that you might have noticed that there's some Hebrew writing, and we put that there because it is actually the, the actual translation of the Christian Ten Commandments. Jews have something like 400 and something that they're supposed to adhere to, but the Christian Ten Commandments are, you know, the ones that everybody knows and they're marketed very well. <laughs> but anyway, so we put it in the Hebrew writing because we thought that was kind of a nice mix, and all of those religions borrow one from another, and they're all interrelated, even though everybody thinks that they have, you know, the best religion and, you know, it's, it's the pure religion, if you will. And we were just, the whole piece is talking about those interconnections and borrowing and stealing and fighting and go on. <laughs> uh, then we have a column that's directly across from that. It's called uh, Order Steeped in Chaos. Um, the pattern in this is actually a traditional uh, Muslim design, an Islamic pattern. Um, and it's actually a Jewish star on its side. So it also kind of talks about uh, conflict in that way. And then at the top of this, of course, it's damaged, so you've got this sort of very beautiful, precise, um, geometric, mathematical column, and yet it's also in chaos and, and disintegrating simultaneously. And we always put this one across from the Moses column because there's a sort of constant back and forth um, that seems appropriate with that one. This is Prayers for Peace, Conga Line Buddhas. And again, we had all these molds. There's a whole bunch of Buddhas in them. So we made a Buddha column. And this one's turned out to be sort of a, an audience favorite, if you will. Uh, I hope you all got to, a chance to write your prayers or dreams and put them in there. And I believe, are you still going to post those? On, they're going to be posted on Facebook, so watch and see if yours comes up. Um, they'll be anonymous. Uh, so don't worry about that either in case you disclose some secret. Don't sign your name to them. Right, don't sign your name. <laughs> Even if you did sign your name, they'll be anonymous. Don't worry. Um, if you sign your name, Hotai won't grant it. <laughs> yeah, he will. But this is also, it's also about prayers. It's also about um, wishing for things. It's also about myths. Um, all of those things combined. And it just seemed appropriate to have this uh, with the Buddhist, Buddhist column. Um, so here we have the, yeah. the conga line Buddhas. <laughs> And again, you know, when we, when we built this piece, we weren't exactly sure how people were going to respond to it, or actually even if people were going to respond to it. Um, we first showed this in a museum, and then we got a call, and they said, you got to empty the Buddhas. So we thought, okay, we'll empty the Buddhas. And Which we is a sentence that's never been said, we think. It's very possible. Um, so we emptied the Buddhas, and then we got a call, you know, every couple of weeks, you got to empty the Buddhas out again. And then finally, we ended up, we realized we had this great big bag full of wishes and dreams, a really powerful thing, um, metaphorically. And it took us a very long time to read these because we felt, you know, in some sense that it might be even a betrayal of trust, that people put them in this thinking no one would ever see them. Um, but we thought about it for a long time, and eventually we couldn't resist. And so we read a few of these. And we had an intern with us who had been working with us for about a year. and. She was just, you know, I mean, she put it the most clearly. She, she said, you know, I went to the opening and everybody was having such a wonderful time and they're hugging and smiling. Just like tonight. <laughs> and then she read the things that were put in the Buddha's belly. And there were, you know, things about failed relationships and there were things about um, people having terminal illnesses and, you know, all of these very, very serious things. So it, it kind of also changed the way that we looked at the work that we were making, that we didn't really think of this as kind of like so much a lighthearted thing, and, and that did happen, but we're shocked by the fact that people really kind of bared their souls putting this in. It's almost a, a psychological um, catharsis in some way. Yeah, we've, and there was a, there's a very strange responsibility that came with that, as he was mentioning, that we, um, 
we were careful on what we did with these. And finally, we actually did start posting those on Facebook, again, anonymously. But also because we thought if they were out into the world, perhaps these wishes and dreams would come to fruition somehow. Like we had some sort of magical power. <laughs> uh, Facebook does, as we all know. Uh, <laughs> But nonetheless, when we started posting them, then people from all across the country started saying, I need to send something through the Buddha's belly. So people started mailing us things. And now we have quite a collection of these. Um, so that we'll see what happens with them at this iteration. And then this we have this column, which deals with serpent mythologies called Medusa in the Garden. Um, now, some of these are commercially made molds, and then some of these are handmade objects. We made the snake, and we made the apples, and a lot of the elements on this. And then as you work your way down, you have Medusa. And Medusa actually began as a baby doll head and the snakes coming out of the head were actually chili peppers. <laughs> so watching the transformation. That's what Medusa was really made out absolutely. of. Absolutely, <laughs> we know the real story. Um, but again, it's, it's one of those things where we're borrowing from even the molds and changing the meaning of it. Uh, again, we had an intern at this point and he actually pulled that mold the first time and he looked at the baby doll head and said, oh, she's so beautiful. And then he watched me as I started carving the eyes into these little snake eyes and he goes, that's just so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and of course then we completed with snakes all around and there's snake scales that go all around this particular piece. And of course then it talks not only about Medusa, but it also talks about uh, the Garden of Eden and the apples, and, and if indeed it was an apple, we don't really know, but some sort of fruit that people partaked in that ended up casting them out of the garden. Um, and those mixing of those um, myths, if you will, were kind of fun to play with. And then we have multiply and divide, which is um, dealing with reproductive science and religion. Um, again, a difficult thing to talk about in a lot of senses. but. Uh, so at the bottom we have you know Easter bunnies and we have all the stuff that deals with you know reproduction and multiplying, and as They're you kissing. work yes, and as you work your way <laughs> up the column, we have these eggs which are you know, oops went the wrong way. There we go. Did I go too many? Yep. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. So they work their way up the column, and then we have these uh, these figures, and we're not exactly sure the origin of these figures. Um, she seems to be holding something that actually looks a little bit sort of a cross between an embryo and actually a Buddha baby. Um, and we're not exactly sure what it is. But we immediately recognized, you know, this sort of transition with the eggs. And so behind her are all these little sort of sperm and eggs carved into the side of the column. So this There's has to do with everything from reproductive science and where it's going, test tube babies, if you will. And of course, beginning with the bunnies at the bottom talks about Easter and religion. And that was all based on a pagan religion. So, you know, we kind of played with that and moved it around a little bit or up the column, as you will. This one is called the War Prayer. And anybody here ever heard of Samuel Clemens? Yeah, Mark Twain. Twain. Good, thank you. We have readers. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Mark Twain wrote this wonderful book called The War Prayer. And it's a, a prayer, you, you can go online and, and read it, and those of you who are students should write it down, because you should read this. It's a, a, a story, if you will, that Mark Twain wrote, and he said that it could not be published until after his death, because it was so controversial. And it was, in essence, um, there was a church congregation, and they were sending their boys off to war, and they were all praying, number one, that they would be safe and that they would slay their enemy and that they would be victorious and that, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel would be that they came home safely. And there's a stranger who appears in the back of the church and he walks forward and he says, I can, I can grant you that wish, but before I do, I want you to know what you're wishing for. And he said, what you're wishing for or what you're praying for is the death of the the children of the mothers of the other community. And what you're praying for is the torture and, and the pain of losing children and people to war. So you can see how this would be a little controversial. 
and uh, do challenge to go read it. But this is, you know, we, we made this column because, again, these are the praying hands. Am I doing all right? Mm -hmm. but the praying hands, and the ones at the top are praying up, and we kind of see that as praying for lofty goals. The ones at the bottom are pointing down. So those of you who might be on a football team, when they say, yeah, let's go win, you know, and they're praying before the uh, uh, game, you know, think about what you're really praying for. And I think it's a very valid um, insight. Um, and this one is called the Tower of Babel. And this has, you know, sort of anything and everything. So we used, we went to the source, the great font of all molds, and we John looked Wayne. for everything. John Wayne is in there. Sneezy from the Seven Dwarves is in there. Um, <coughs> And, of course, the ubiquitous baby doll head. Yeah, with the fork tongue. <laughs> um, but also, we have these things right here. We have these hands that are giving all these different signals. These things actually emerged from a set of praying hands mold. Um, and so it was interesting, you know, obviously we do everything wrong, so you're not supposed, you're supposed <laughs> to put these things in the mold and you take them out when they're, you know, good and hard and they leather hard um, and they're going to, give you the mold that you wanted. We instead took these things out when they were good and sopping wet and some of them just completely fell apart. But some of them were you know, stiff enough that they allowed us to sort of cut these things apart and articulate them in different ways. And suddenly all these signs started coming out, everything from you know, live long and prosper to gang signs. And the idea is that you know, <laughs> symbols mean different things to different people and they're all changeable. Um, and this is kind of like the ultimate, I think, iteration of that in some ways. And the idea, at least for me, metaphorically, that these things all emerge from a set of praying hands is a really, really interesting thing. And then they went out in the world and they became what they were going to become. Oh, and in case you don't know, the, the story of the Tower of Babel is that civilization built this tower up to God and they thought that they were, they were so mighty, the humans were mighty enough to build a tower that was high enough to reach the heavens. And at that point, God went, uh-uh, no, you're not. And he, he tore down the temple, and he divided the people, and this is where the different languages were supposed to have happened. So we could no longer communicate. We could no longer organize to do something like that. Um, this is actually where it all began. This is one of the little vignettes called the Enlightenment. Um, and this was the first you know, set of molds that we actually played with. And we had this little thing emerge from it. And we were at that time, we were doing something with California Center for the Arts Museum. Um, and we said, well, you know, this could potentially grow into something bigger, but we don't really know what. And, and it was very nice that they actually um, really had the faith in us to just say, OK, you know, we like what you're doing. We want to do something with you. And we trust that you know, you'll make something interesting from this. And from here, it grew into the, you know, the monster that it is today. Which is interesting that they used faith and trust, and then we made this whole piece that talks about those True. things. Oh, you're good. I know. <laughs> That's why you married me. <laughs> um, and before I go on, I did notice something on the other one. For those of you who are ceramicists and perfect ceramicists, I won't apologize for it, but I do want to note that the pieces that we have made, you'll see rough edges on these. And we decided to leave those rough edges because we wanted people to know that they're from molds and that they came commercially. And we thought that that was sort of important to the piece. Now, to continue, this piece again is seeing is believing. And uh, we have here a picture of a mariner slaying a mermaid, which is a myth, not the mariner, but the mermaid. There in the front is a leprechaun, and over on the right hand, your right hand side is Jesus in a um, Christmas ball. So these are all really, to some extent, mythological constructs. And we thought it was kind of interesting to sort of put them all together and make those comparisons. Everybody can make their own comparisons for them. But seeing is believing. Um, this one is called Promises Unfulfilled. This is actually the same figure that was on Multiply and Divide. Now she has been morphed into something else. She's basically becoming a vessel, giving of herself to angels that, you know, nothing ever comes out so they don't receive anything. They just perpetually wait for something to happen um, that never arrives. Now, again, there are little nuances to these pieces, and this one, of course, has to do with women and the strength that women have and being a vessel. It could be talking about women um, and having uh, childbirth, 
women uh, becoming vessels for love and nurturing. nurturing, those kinds of things, but in this one, that's been separated. Um, and we have this one, this is Art from the Trenches. This was actually made, um, we made a mold from a, um, an artillery shell that my grandfather brought back from World War I. And uh, this was, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of trench art before, um, but it's something that soldiers did, you know, in World War I people were mired down in trenches for months at a time looking for some way to, you know, keep themselves sane and occupied. Um, one of the things that they would do is actually make uh, art from whatever materials they had. Um, and also the artisans that were local would go out into the fields and they'd pick up these shells because there was, of course, you know, lack of all sorts of materials. So anything that they could use, they would take advantage of. Um, art survives. Yeah. So this would, became sort of a, a luminaria, something beautiful and, and giving from, from basically weapons of destruction. And these are all a little associated vignettes to the piece, and this one sort of is the, the final piece that we made, and it talks about all of the war and the conflict that has been caused by religion. And, you know, we're not saying that any religion is bad. We're not saying that any religion is good. What we're saying is that pay attention to what religion is doing. And, of course, with the things that are happening even right now in Syria, you know, the, the issue comes up again. And so uh, for those reasons, the, the piece we think is very significant. And then at sort of the end of this columnade, you come to the sarcophagus. These are some of the actual molds that the pieces are made of. So you can kind of see some of those familiar forms um, in this itself. And also it looks like a tomb uh, very much. And this is the interior view. And now we'll move on to maybe something lighter. <laughs> Maybe, but probably not. Maybe, but, <laughs> but not entirely. Um, so this is something else that Debbie and I have been doing for years. We actually started doing these when we met in art school uh, many, many years ago. Pay attention, students. This is, this is when it begins. <laughs> Never actually really thought of this even as an extension of our art in any way. But, you know, at night, you know, during the day, we would, we would stay in the studio as long as we could. Sometimes we would sneak in and work at night when we weren't supposed to be there. Don't do that. It's um, bad. When eventually we would get <laughs> caught, you know, in the middle of the night and they'd throw us out, we would go to an all-night restaurant and we would sit and chat and we would play with the stuff that they gave us, any of the paper goods, anything that's disposable. Um, and we started making things out of that. Um, it was only about four years ago that we actually thought, you know, we, these, some of these are kind of interesting. We actually want to start documenting them. So we started taking some images of these things and realized that, you know, with the right photograph, these things became very grand. Um, this particular one, 4th of July, New York Harbor, is made out of chopstick wrappers and toothpicks. Um, all these things are actually shot in the restaurant, made only with the materials that they give us. Um, we don't bring any tools, we don't bring scissors, tape, glue, anything like that. We so. actually have rules that we've devised for this and we still don't really know why. <laughs> True. Because that way we can break them, there's something to break. <laughs> um, and I'm going to read the text for the 4th of July, uh, New York Harbor, just this one piece. Um, a silhouette of liberty rises against the backdrop of the night sky. She reads from a book of practical knowledge. The date July, 7, July 4th, 1776, replaced with instructions and the proper use of chopsticks. Her copper on iron construction has been supplanted by chopstick wrappers and toothpicks. She is built of the stuff of immigrants, and she is the embodiment of the hope and dreams that America offers. Come to America, the land of plenty, and you will eat. But this is a land of both immense freedoms and ironies. The erection of the Statue of Liberty was widely criticized as many Americans voiced the opinion that the expense of erecting it was a frivolous waste of money, that only Americans should design American public artworks. Some even argued that the torch should not be lit until the United States became a free nation for all its inhabitants. What her, a bad idea. Her installation was completed in 1886, just four years after the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed the first of many discriminatory laws designed to bar Chinese laborers from attaining citizenship. Similar restrictions on immigration would target nearly every ethnic group seeking citizenship thereafter. So this particular piece, even though you go, oh, Statue of Liberty, it's cool. That, look what they made out of wrap, wrapping papers. Because it's made out of chopsticks, it's important. Because the colors in it are sort of this red and green, it's the copper that the, the structure was made of. 
Um, you know, there's even a, I think those are chopstick, there's a fortune cookie thing in the middle of it, which, you know, give me your tired, your poor, could also apply to that. So even though they are fun and they really do talk about our collaboration together, they are also very serious in another way. Now, not all of them are quite as serious, but they are very, very serious and they have uh, very deep meanings. We don't always know that at dinner when we're making them, but all of a sudden that it evolves over time as we start to really think what we've done, you know, and it becomes sort of an important thing. This one is called M Masonic G Spot. Mm -hmm. So um, it really doesn't have anything to do with a G Spot, except for uh, it's not a sexual thing for those of you who might be going there. But indeed, this is one, uh, it's kind of a fun thing in that we made this at a dinner at a place that uh, my father liked very much, and uh, he's passed away now, but he, he was a, a Mason, and I found out later that Larry's father was a Mason, and um, we have no real ties to that, but all of a sudden this piece appeared, if you will, on the table one night, and as we were making it, neither of us knew what the G stood for. But we thought it was a G, but we weren't really sure, you know, and then we thought, well, it's, it's got to be for God, right? Or we didn't know. Or geometry. Or geometry. Well, we found that out later. And, and so we made this little construction that we thought kind of looked like what we both vaguely remembered. And we went home, and it's actually very accurate. And uh, the G does stand for God or geometry, which is interesting, those of you who like the Da Vinci codes and all that. Mm -hmm. This is a piece we did in an Indian restaurant. It's called Sukrasattva. This entire piece was made out of a sugar packet, so it's about this big, probably. Um, very tiny. In fact, we almost accidentally threw it out once. Um, oh, and, and the guy on there is actually a baker. So, <laughs> so we did this piece in the restaurant, and we created this mudra, this multi-armed you know, figure, and the waiter came up and asked us if we had done this piece, and he looked at it for a minute. And well, then he, he asked it like this, he said, did you do this? And then we immediately went, uh, yeah. You know, we thought, and he's not going to like this at all, so go ahead. So he actually went back to the kitchen, he brought out the people from the back, and they came up to the table and they were all admiring it. Some people bowed to this. Um, so it actually was a, became a very powerful thing. It was surprising to us again the fact that you can create um, sort of a shrine out of almost you know nothing, something so un, unimportant in a way. But it became meaningful to other people. So in the same way that the tower did, you know, we were always we we no longer kind of take for granted that these things are always necessarily tongue in cheek, but recognize that this could potentially have you know greater meaning for somebody else. This is an environmental piece called Species in the Balance. Um, again, part of the beauty of this and the challenge of this is as an artist trying to work with nothing. When you have the most minimal materials and you think, you know, what can I possibly do with this? And I would say nine times out of ten, we're just on the verge of giving up. And then there's, you know, one of us will make, tweak one little thing and suddenly there's a light bulb and the other will pick it up and kind of make changes to it and something emerges. So the idea of making something like this that stands out of, you know, with no glue, no tape, nothing like that, is really difficult. This stands because they gave us an orange for dessert. We stuck the straw in the orange. Um, we tied these and also, you know, those little uh, paper napkin rings that they give you with a little bit of adhesive on it is absolute gold to us when we do these. <laughs> we could build a building with those things. <laughs> oh, it's also important to note, um, especially for the art students in here, that these actually we've determined become public art in situ. I mean, they're, they're, you know, we're sitting in a restaurant and, you know, some people say playing with your food, it's not quite that simple, but um, we're playing with the detritus from our food, so it also talks about ecology and uh, the environment. But then the people around you start to become involved in the process. And uh, you may have seen the one over there with the ballerina in it. For that particular one, there was a guy sitting next to us and he leans over at one point and he goes, what are you doing? <laughs> and uh, we said, well, we're, we're, we're making something. And he goes, you're artists, aren't you? <laughs> and we said, yeah, we are. And he goes, well, what are you making? And I said, well, actually, he says, it's a ballerina, isn't it? And I said, yeah, it is. And the guy got up in the middle of a sizzler 
and he started dancing and twirling. <laughs> and he goes, not bad for 80, huh? <laughs> And so here's a, here's a case where somebody saw art, they experienced art, and you know that was probably the first thing from their mind that evening is going to see somebody make art. But here we were making it and it became this community endeavor, this happening, if you will. And that is what really delights us about these things, outside of the fact that we get to work together. Oh, and our dinners are tax deductible. That's true. <laughs> Uh, that came about year two. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually these things uh, moved on from still photography, although we still do that, and we realized some of these things actually wanted to move. And then we had to kind of think of ways to actually make that happen, which included uh, everything from uh, stop motion animation to uh, puppetry and wind power and anything we could possibly think that would uh, make these things actually move in some way. This is another one, just before he hits it. Um, for those students in the room, again, when you think you have nothing to work with, or maybe you know your finances are directed toward food this particular month, <laughs> this is, uh, we went to a Thai restaurant, and we had nothing to work with. They, you know, they had cloth napkins, God forbid. What, what are too, we going to do with nice that? Too nice for us, too upscale. Yeah. And so we have to you know, go to our own our restaurants that we can afford. But So at the end of the meal, you know, we said, well, we wanted to make something tonight, but there was nothing there. At the end of the meal, they brought us a mint. <laughs> and this is the wrapper. Change now.
So we think that's probably one of the most, um, minim obviously minimalist, but um, it's a little bit of a nod to Yoko Ono and her music. Uh, we did do all the music ourselves as well. Um, um, so this is the last piece. This is the candy store. Um, these are in some way related to uh, Klaus Oldenburg's store from 1961. He did this, you know, he came out of abstract expressionism and at that time the idea of even making a representation of something was considered absolutely ridiculous if you were, you know, considered a serious artist. Um, he decided he was actually going to go beyond that, not just make a representation of objects, but make sort of a physical representation of those things as well. And he would set up the store and he would sell you know, one, one day it would be dresses and clothing, and the other a day it might be food, elements like this. He did some great little candy bars, too. You know, still with the abstract expressionist maybe feel for the paint, and you could see sort of the texture and the love of, of, of playing with the paint. Our piece is similar to that in that we're kind of blurring the line between commodity and art um, also. But we also have this thing where we're also talking about, um, you know, the potential power and harm of, of the medical system. Um, we're talking about uh, marketing, especially, um, especially things like tobacco. A little bit of corporate greed thrown in for fun. And this is a piece that kind of like constantly changes. So the first time we showed it, it was at the California Center for the Arts. It really occupied sort of the small case. It had a few of the, I think, important ideas. It had uh, some of this, the uh, canopic vessels which are actually made with medications ground up in the glazes and then fired, so those things have medications in them physically. Um, and it also had uh, the candy boxes and it had some of the tobacco bears, which talks about marketing. And the idea behind this was that we used the cigar boxes, which are really, you know, they have these beautiful graphics, they're very catchy. People use them for uh, jewelry boxes and for purses. Um, and so we kind of... They're also frightening. Exactly, in a way. <laughs> And, and the bears are themselves, too, because they're, they're kind of like simplified versions. Probably if you put this on the Antiques Roadshow, somebody would say, ah, obviously these are 200 years old and made on a plantation where they had no materials to work with. Um, but it, it talks about the idea of marketing, and we've incorporated that into the pieces. So the idea of marketing this, which some people in our context think of as kind of shameless, is actually appropriate for this thing completely. And these are a couple of the vessels, and the um, iconography that you see on the vessels actually has to do with the medication that is actually ground up into the glazes. Um, it's like this one, the orange one here is Vioxx, and Vioxx was a medication that was um, out for pain. And it was actually fairly good for pain, but it also seemed to be killing people with heart attacks. So, you know, there's a balance. But you can see on the top that there are legs on there. And again, we borrowed from all those molds that that woman gave us. But this one has deer legs on it. So if you have pain, you know, if you have pain, generally it hits you first in your joints. Mm -hmm. So we, we put these things on here. The Darvaset um, is, a, was that a mood enhancer or something? No, it's a kind of pain. pain, pain oh, that's pillar. a pain pill. That's a pain pill, that's right. It's a pain pill, mm -hmm. but it's one of those that will really knock you down. Uh, and so you might actually start to see these spotted cats. <laughs> and we also <laughs> recognize, you know, once we started gathering these things to actually put into the glazes, we realized, you know, just how many medications over the course of time you actually use. They're in the shelves and you don't really think about them and they might be out of date. Um, this shows us kind of grinding them up and putting them into the glaze. And here are a couple others from that. Um, the candy is actually color coded so that these things become like talismans. So, you know, if you can't afford health care um, or insurance, you can have one of these things and hold it close to you and you get, you know, if nothing else, maybe the placebo benefit. Um, oh, and, and when people actually found out that we had some old Vioxx, we had people calling us up and say, can, can I have one of those? <laughs> I said, we don't do that. That's, that's the boundary <laughs> we can't cross with this project. There are some. But that's why we started making the little candies that they could carry around with them, and maybe the placebo effect would work. Um, as, I, as I said, this, this is a piece that kind of grows and changes depending on the venue. So uh, after that show, we actually took this to Tijuana, um, and this was a place called La Casa del Tunnel, which was actually a drug smuggling tunnel <laughs> that they discovered. They filled in the drug smuggling tunnel, and then they got a really nice Annenberg grant and turned this into an art foundation. 
Um, and you can see the you know wall just beyond. It was right on the very edge of the parking lot for the U.S. Yeah, this right here is the actual border. Mm -hmm. And these are a couple of our interns helping us. That's uh, Sarah Watlington and Zach Wilkie. And one of the pieces that we did, there was also this piece called Passages, which dealt with the fact that this was a smuggling tunnel and people were you know, constantly also uh, going across. So we created these vans and we cut these teardrop shapes out and actually made necklaces out of them. And these became luminaria for people who crossed and maybe either you separated from those people in the crossing or perhaps they died. Um, and these uh, became things that people could actually take and, and keep as a memorial and, and wear them. So the candy store does change from each venue. We actually add new pieces to it as it goes, and sometimes we subtract pieces if we don't think that it's appropriate for a particular venue. So this is one of that one of that, one and of that case. Yeah, La Casa is kind of a famous place. They're actually the hotel across the street. They did have narco corridos talking about that particular hotel as a as a crossing point. So you can see it grew just a little bit when we took it over to Tijuana. And there's all kinds of stories we'll talk about later about bringing it back across the border with Vioxx and Vicodin written on those. Oh. <laughs> yes, yeah, it, took, it took a year to get that show back, <laughs> one box at a time, uh, because the, the gallery owners were just terrified they were going to get stopped. Um, this was one of the, you know, the changes in the context, depending on how you place them, the idea of these lab coats kind of hovering at, at body level above this body. And the body is actually made from, we call it toxic cocktails, but it's made from swizzle sticks. Um, the swizzle sticks have carved in them the names of uh, medications that have been removed from the market by the FDA because they were deemed not to be safe. Um, so the swizzle sticks themselves kind of articulate into the joints of this really beautifully and look very much like a skeleton. This is also a piece that was shown with at Space for Art with your museum studies class here that um, so we didn't put it in this one so because we didn't want it to be redundant. Um, this was we did sort of a one day um, episode at Agitprop Gallery it was kind of an educational opportunity um, but the high point of this I th think was the placement of the video. Yeah, you can see there's a video wall um, we created a video that was first a marketing campaign so that we could actually afford to send this thing to uh, Tijuana uh, but the rest of it had, at the very end, cigarette commercials from the 50s and 60s, and everybody above a certain age knew those songs, and they were whistling along with them or singing with them. Um, and then you notice there was a transition from the tobacco commercials, and then when those became illegal, they transitioned into pharmaceutical commercials. And you'd see commercials that said, you know, tell your doctor you'd like the little purple pill or whatever it happened to be. Which you all are accustomed to seeing now. Right, which has been followed by, you know, lawyer commercials, you know, if you've been harmed by this medication. Um, so you start to see these weird transitions. The commercials, you know, this is an actual, you know, Flintstones commercial sponsored by Winston Cigarettes. And that was Barney and Fred smoking out behind the garage so Wilma and uh, Betty wouldn't find them. Yeah. And we also found this thing online. <laughs> and I'll show it to you first and we'll tell you what it is. Thanks, David. Good night, David. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> so this was an Edison kinetoscope made in 1897. This was one of the first moving pictures ever made. Wow. And the first, one of the first things they thought to do with this amazing technology and all the potential that it had was, let's sell cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> So, so is it any wonder people had trouble stopping? So it's, it's certainly deep, deeply ingrained in the culture. So we saw this and we started thinking, well, when we saw the Indian there, and it was you know, sort of a fake American Indian, um, someone dressed as an American Indian, and we thought, well, we'd like to do something with a cigar store Indian. We wanted to do something that didn't have sort of the ramifications of that. And at the same time, we were looking at these images of Colombia, and Colombia is sort of the embodiment of the Americas um, and so we thought maybe there's a way to find some sort of natural combination of these two things. There's Columbia Pictures, uh, Columbia from the Capitol Building, and this is one of our interns who uh, posed for the sculpture that we ended up making. Which is sitting over in the gallery now. 
Not our intern, but the sculpture. <laughs> That's how we made it. Smoking Columbia. So what you're seeing in here, this piece is um, based on something that really started our country, and we were founded on tobacco industry. And uh, it's become, it, it had become, it's a little bit less now, but it's still being marketed to the students here. So if you're smoking, stop. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't started, don't. But nonetheless, uh, this, this image here, we decided it was, Columbia was the appropriate image to actually put some tobacco leaves on. And a friend of ours from that La Casa del Tunnel had in his possession some tobacco leaves. Uh, we don't know where they came from. It might have been Cuba, but we didn't ask. And so we actually put some of those tobacco leaves on this piece and around the cigar. They're really wood, but they look like cigars. So um, we thought that was important to the uh, structure of the candy store. And then finally, same image of the, the, our intern on here smoking. Uh, we decided that we would make some tobacco papers. And uh, these are handmade. Uh, and they actually have tobacco in the papers. And we decided to make these as sort of gift cards for people that you wanted to stop smoking, or maybe if there's somebody in your life who wouldn't stop smoking, you know, you write a little letter to them, or, you know, as condolence if um, they actually passed away. And something kind of important with this candy store piece to know is that um, artists are often motivated by personal things. and. In my life, um, I have a brother who actually died from using pharmaceuticals that were prescribed to him, and he misused them. Uh, that was important. I also had two parents who passed away of cancer from smoking. So, you know, it's not my little own tirade about this, but it's something that people need to be as associated with and understand. So we try and use a little bit of humor, um, poking fun at things, but also very, very serious. Okay. And so those were some of the new pieces of rad when we took this thing to San Francisco at um, Mission Cultural Center for Latino Arts. And uh, it was a wonderful show. And they said, are you okay doing Spanish language radio? And we said, sure, we'd be happy to do interviews, but we don't speak Spanish. And so we went into the radio booth, and it was a great interview, I think. But every once in a while, the, uh, the person who would forget to do the translations, and they would just look at us, and there was like this blank moment of silence, uh, which isn't good on radio. I, say, I think what you're trying to say is, um, but we talked about the candy store and they did a lot of outreach, which was great. And it changes for every venue, so we've got some new additions for the show that we have here. Uh, the first mechanical pieces that we've really done in association with us, the medical Mustaba Ferris wheel, um, which has some medications from our cabinet and some from others' cabinets, we actually had a dinner party and we had some friends come and they asked if they could bring anything for dinner and we said, yes, do you have any extra <laughs> old <medication>? balls <laughs> in your cabinet? You can empty them out if you'd like. Um, and so we incorporated some of those things into this piece. And then finally, uh, it's just recreational, which is a really fun piece for us because we realized uh, when we painted the uh, scenes around the outside edge that this is like the first time we painted in 15 years, which was very, very much fun. And we think we still have it. Yes, and we argued over who was going to get to paint each panel. <laughs> and I think that's all we have images of. So at this point, if you want to do a little question and answer, if anybody has any questions, we'd be happy to talk to you. Yes? How long are your dinner sessions? Um, it depends. The longest one was about three hours. Oh, wow. And that was for the piece called Holy Rollers at Tony Roma's. <laughs> um, but most of the time, it's, uh, it happens even sometimes while we eat, so it can be, you know, like 15 minutes. The, pho the photograph, photography of it is the thing that really takes the longest, I think, because it's all about, you know, the artist's eye and seeing where it's going to look the best. Yeah, each, each one of the photos, you know, we might shoot 50 photos before we get the one, like the, um, the Virgin of Guadalupe Chipotle that's in there on the wall. You know, we took endless photos of this, and the very last one, some weird thing happened, and there was a color shift, and it went from silver to gold. And we thought, that's gold. Oh. I mean, that's the only It's a thing miracle. Yeah. <laughs> that's the one. We do a lot of works that just end up being miracles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Other questions? Did you ever get kicked out of a, a ah. restaurant? Out of a restaurant? Mm -hmm. No, but, but no. you can tell that they're usually thinking about it at first because we're going to places <laughs> where everything's disposable. 
and they, they want you to get in and eat and out. Exactly. You know? <laughs> it's, it's a strange thing when people hang out for more than 20 minutes, something's wrong. So, you know, first they'll start kind of cruising the place and then looking out of the side of their head. And then we notice that the wait staff will start to come by every once in a while and look at what we're doing. And before we're done, they'll usually get involved and they'll ask, you know, can we bring anything else? And they'll bring people over to. Oh, as a doing. matter of fact, um, uh, these kind people here, the Gartners, we introduced us to a place in Escondido called Sushiyama. And they're really great staff there because we work there a lot and there's, they give you a lot of paper and it's wonderful. But unfortunately, they're very, very diligent about coming by and cleaning up. Oh. So they've thrown away two of our pieces. <laughs> if you read in the book, we actually made a book with all of these boats in it. And then we realized one of the vessels was missing and there's a guy floating there. So we had to create a story to make up for the fact that somebody pulled the piece out and, and took it away. Yeah. Do you keep them or do you leave them We there? do. We, no, we keep them. Oh, keep we, can we have a doggy bag, please? <laughs> and they understand at that point, you know. It's and that's also part of the beauty of it. It's like the staging of the photograph. When you look at the objects themselves, they can look completely like junk. In fact, we had an intern that wanted to see. There was one with a dinosaur, and he was dying to see it. And we brought it out, and it's like, oh, <laughs> that's, it. that's it. It's this little pile of napkin, which is really kind of nothing. Else. But again, it's all about you know how you perceive it, and how you view it, and getting that that perfect image capturing that moment. But we have shown those with them before, and it's kind of an interesting juxtaposition. Yeah. Uh, we just didn't think it was appropriate here, space-wise, number one, and number two, it just sometimes looks nice just to see the finished mm -hmm. work. Yeah. Yes? Uh, I was just wondering, I know you didn't know how hard it was going to be, but why did you decide on eight feet? For? The eight. columns. For the columns. Yeah. Because do you see the little uh, variegated sections in there? Those are actually, are those vases? No, they're vases. Possibly. We and don't know. so when you stack them up, that's what looked good. It's about aesthetics, I think. Well, I'd actually say some of our most interesting collaborations are with people who aren't artists. We're, we're really interested in sciences. Um, and those are kind of the conversations that we you know, have at, at events, and we realize, oh, there's a way to kind of like. Um, work in a different way. There's actually a, a wonderful physicist here, Dr. He's Mark right over Tyler. here. <laughs> um, and we draw him into our projects every once in a while. We deal with something where the science is a little bit nebulous for us, and he can kind of put it in layman's terms. We did a, a piece called Electric Fields of California that um, is a piece where we lit fluorescent bulbs with the ambient electromagnetic fields from power towers. Just, you know, you could stand outside and hold these things in your hand. It's a really beautiful effect. They're the and same then, light bulbs you have in here, by the way, only exactly. longer. So, you know, we have, you know, he's a generous enough person to let us, you know, invade his house and, and figure out, you know, how these things actually work. And, and every once in a while we do something with sciences that's kind of deaf, we definitely pull him in. And, of course, our interns. We, we use a lot of interns, mm -hmm. and uh, they are, you know, they always come in first very shy and, and okay, what would you like me to do? And then finally we go, you know, tell us what you think about this, you know, engage us. And, and, and we share those ideas. So uh, on our website, actually, jugglingclines.com, jugglingclines by the way, um, we have dedicated a page to our interns that have worked with us at, at the house because um, they're so important to us. So most of your ceramic work appears to be done with molds. How did you do the Columbia? Columbia was actually carved out of foam like a, a very dense uh, foam used for architecture. Which most of the things in California, I, I think by law now, have to be done with this architectural foam because uh, other things would fall off of buildings during earthquakes. So it won't hurt you if it falls off. And that, like a lot of these projects, for us is about experimentation. So we like using media that we haven't really used before and then we try to think, you know, how far can you push it before something fails? But, but I had a question. Um, about your, the process of working together. Because, I mean, you think of artists as usually they're individuals working on their own, and I've collaborated with people, and it's tricky sometimes. You know, some people you can work with very well, and you know, sometimes, and so how, how does that work? I mean, do you always agree? Do you always, do you ever fight over who's gonna do what? Do you, over, do you always, I, I'm just interested in that. When we first started, when I had a museum career of like 20 years before I came here to came here to make art with Larry, and um, before we made the decision, we decided to actually again draft rules to a certain extent on what we were going to do because I cherish my marriage with him, 
and I've known other artists who tried to collaborate and they ended up, you know, going different directions. So uh, it's one of mutual respect. Um, if somebody has an idea, you don't go, oh, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> you know, no. Even if you think it, you, you trying to tell say me something? No. Nope. <laughs> I thought you were trying to tell me something. But, um, and, and those don't always work. You know, we definitely um, disagree on things. We actually write together, if you can imagine, and we write music together as well. And those are very intimate processes, and, and to do that together is hard. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, if we're writing music, we'll be si somebody will be sitting at the computer and, you know, with the keyboard and doing all kinds of crazy things with the music on those videos. And then you get to a point where you go, okay, done, tag team, you do it. I can't do it anymore. Although, yeah, I do think we have, we have also a lot of similar skill sets. We have different ones, but we also cross over. So yeah. I don't think there's any territory where one of us just that's their thing to do and the other one does something else. And that means that a lot of these projects, when we go, we look at the final process or the final product, it's kind of difficult to even say who did what on some of these things. You know, and which is we don't nice. know sometimes now. Oh, that was a good idea I had. And he goes, well, I had that idea. <laughs> oh, yeah. well, I think that was mine, <laughs> which and is great. And in the end, doesn't matter really. Yeah. So, um, yes, and sometimes we do argue about things, but it's not, it's not the kind of arguing that will ever lead to a separation because we also know that this is kind of sappy, but we know that our, our marriage is cemented with love and respect. And uh, we can have those controversies, right? And stucco and cement. Yeah, and, yeah, and stucco and cement. And clay. And mud. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and, and we know that it will survive. You know, if, if you get mad and walk away and you finally come back and go, okay, I'm sorry, you know, <laughs> and that's okay. But, I, I mean, it's hard for me to even remember what it was like to work alone. I, yeah. It seems so natural now. And, um, again, it's a little bit sappy, but when we don't work together and we're away from each other, uh, I miss him. <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when the big bar fills the screen. <laughs> Do a beaver. <laughs> I worked at the Indianapolis Museum of Art and then the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago and then out here at the um, California Center for the Arts Museum. And you? And I was a, also a museum photographer and I worked at Indianapolis Museum of Art and um, the Art Institute, and I did some shoots for the MCA in Chicago and for various galleries. And then we moved out here. So we also um, we also curate exhibitions and uh, do that kind of stuff together, and that's great fun. We and the, when I said we write together, we actually have written a couple of catalogs. We do argue about semantics, but I figure if that's the worst thing you argue about, you're okay. <laughs> Any? Yeah. Do you guys, uh, a couple questions, do you work out of, out of your home? Is that your studio <laughs> per se, or do you use restaurants? Oh. And, uh, <laughs> That's and a good I, idea. Yeah, I drag my saw into a restaurant. You don't have to actually rent it. You know? and I was wondering <laughs> if, and where you store all your belongings, all, all the artwork. Pieces. And I was also wondering, um, you said you more recently started developing uh, animated artwork, like the carousel, like the Ferris wheel. Is that a direction you're going in, or do you have any, uh, yeah. or did the new ideas just pop up and you go with them, or uh, where are you going? Well, that's a book. Yeah. Uh, so, in answer to your questions, where did you start with that? Um, uh, with the, oh, do, we, we work, work at home. We work, work at home. So, when we want to get away from work, we leave home. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, we actually create a lot on the road when we're out driving around. We share ideas that yeah. way, and that's a very good creative time. Um, and then, what else was there? Where do you so store houses? Oh. Houses like the studio? <laughs> yeah, we actually, yeah. we got a grant from a place called Center for Cultural Innovation out of Los Angeles, uh, I guess in 2010, which let us do an extension onto our house, and that's also given us a, like a nice studio, outdoor studio, indoor, outdoor place to work, which has been nice.
Yeah. I mean, it's not a bona fide studio. It's more like you know patio, but it's amazing. But it helps. And we live in Escondido. You know, doing large so installations like this, shade. eventually that stuff tends to creep into your house anyway, just yeah. because you're okay. working every place. In storage, garage. Yeah. There was a time we parked a car in there, <laughs> but it doesn't work that way anymore. If anyone has any storage units that they don't need, or they need to have <laughs> filled with something, we'd be happy to accommodate. And Alessandra can tell you that the boxes go from floor to ceiling over in their storage area. <laughs> so it's, we, we actually, and because I was a registrar, though, I have everything cataloged and I know where everything is <laughs> generally. Every box was numbered. Every box was numbered. We need help when we have to pack up the show. So. <laughs> this is a call for volunteers. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, he asked if there was a connection, if I'm right, between the different pieces, like the pills and the columns and the, the my dinner with the clients piece. I would say that there are just because we're all human and those are things that we all um, face. And for us as artists, I'd say a lot of the work that we do does deal with social issues in some way. Even Even the things, the dinner things, where we don't really have any kind of preconception, we just make it up on the spot. When we found we were putting them together for the book and we said, oh wait, these are categorized. There's like something about religion, there's stuff about politics, there's stuff about like all these different, you know, issues. So I think that just kind of naturally comes out. And that's you know. that's a human characteristic as well, just to make sense of your world and, and to sort of compartmentalize things. It can be dangerous sometimes to compartmentalize things. Um, you know, it's, it's like when you go to, um, uh, art fairs, you know, sometimes they will have, you know, photography over here and sculpture over here and paintings over here and they shouldn't touch. <laughs> but it's okay if they do. Um, our art fair here doesn't do that, but some other art fairs does. And it, it's, uh, it's, as an artist, that's just kind of interesting to watch. But anybody else? I hope you're not too exhausted. We <laughs> have enjoyed this so much, and we thank each and every one of you for spending time with us. Such a scene in the night today. Oh, and yes, I bet the stain. And although I may be righteous, my own mouth. May bear me blame. Please drop me in the water oh, and scrub me on the stone so that I'll be wearing purest white when they call my body home.